This video was a long time coming. I originally scripted out a video on the subject after Volume 5, but by the time I got around to it, Volume 6 was starting and I decided to give them a chance. And after the massive spike in quality, I felt no need to even talk about this. But then all those Glassdoor reviews came in, and now I'm finding myself trying to rework a year old script to answer the question once and for all. Why is Ruby so broken, and how broken is it? One of the problems I consistently had with the script early on is trying to get to the meat and potatoes in a feasible amount of time. I just couldn't do it. This is not the kind of subject that can be handled in under 10 minutes. So this will be part one in my Honest Look at Kirby series that I'll be working on until Volume 7 starts. And at the time of this recording, it's looking like it'll be an eight-part series, but that's subject to change. In this video, I'll be covering the command structure of Kirby and try to figure out what fundamental flaws it might have and what has changed throughout the years. At the top of any production, you have the studio. They're not creatively involved, but they dictate the budget. It's their money at stake, they sign the checks, they pay the bills. So long as their capitalistic endeavors pay off, they're happy. At the very bottom of a production, there are technicians, the individual animators and designers that actually put in all the work for a show. I usually put them in three categories, visual, sound, and editors. The visual teams are your rigorous production designers, modelers, animators, cinematographers, makeup, costumes, concept artists, whatever. The sound team are your sound designers, mixers, as well as voice actors and musicians. Then you have the editors, which bring it all together into a cohesive whole. And serving as captain for these crews is the director and writers. The writers provide the theoretical framework through the script. The director's job is to make sure everyone else does their job. A good director can do a little bit of everything. He can work with actors, work with artists and technicians and cameramen and scores and editors. A great director can add his expertise. A great director is an actor or I'm just going to let Orson Welles explain. The only job that a director can do in a film of real value is to do something more than what will happen automatically. The middleman between the director and the studio is the producer. The producer's job is threefold. One, see that the crew's needs are met. Two, make sure they are using time and money wisely. Three, make sure the studio is happy. Keep those three points in mind as they will come up numerous times throughout these videos. Sure, a studio is risking money, actors and directors their reputation, technicians their future job prospects, but a producer's entire livelihood can be uprooted from just one disaster. When Ruby first started, it had a small crew, all of which had only ever worked on other web series. On the whole, it was a pretty ambitious project for everyone involved. Nobody in the crew had ever worked on something with a long-form story, and it's easy to see and understand that they didn't really know what they were doing. Grey Headache was the producer, Monty Ohm was the director, and one of three writers, along with Miles and Carrie. Now, your mileage may vary, but I never liked the term passion project, at least as it pertains to Ruby and Monty's vision. People, I won't name any names, but I will flash a few logos on screen, like to pretend that early Ruby was Monty's passion project that he alone handcrafted. Some of these same people like to pretend that following Monty's death, Miles, Carrie, and Grace swept in and stole his vision as their own. It's actually just an excuse. Ruby was always broken. People just failed to notice until after Monty's death. Without inexplicable monty nostalgia, they were more ready and willing to identify those flaws even if those flaws have always been there. Just an example, all those people bitching about shoehorn characters in Volume 6 should really reevaluate the fact that Neo was made up last minute because Monty didn't want to animate Torchwick's escape during the mech fight. Because designing, modeling, and rigging a character is so much easier and faster than just having Torchwick step onto a ship. Not only does this blind Monty nostalgia do a disservice to people like Miles and Carrie who have been there since the beginning, but it also does a disservice to Monty himself. As much as I never gelled with his style, as much as I loathe Dead Fantasy, as much as I think RVB Season 10 is overrated, I can't deny the dude's resolve. When he passed away, the greatest loss wasn't his vision, and it sure as hell wasn't his writing quality. It was the fact he was a hands-on director who would work 15 hour days chugging down Mountain Dews and Doritos to make sure shit got done. And for my money, that's a lot harder to replace and not the kind of thing you can forcibly replace. Carrie simply lacks the technical expertise to help the teams do their job to their fullest. He's more or less lucked into some inspired scenes in his tenure as director. He's a pretty funny guy, a half-decent writer, a pretty good voice actor, which has led to post-Monty Ruby having most of the best moments both in script and in delivery. 
but the overall production quality has suffered for the all too simple fact that he's not an animator. What I can discern across all of Ruby is a lack of communication and time between different departments. This is usually a sign of a weak director. Going back to that Orson Welles bit, an incompetent director can hide his incompetency by surrounding himself with talented people. By that same merit, he exposes his incompetence when things don't line up and we're told one thing but shown something else. Or that the producer isn't giving people the time and resources they need. And to Rooster Teeth's credit, following the Glassdoor review controversy, they've made two moves that could fix this problem. The first is adding two more permanent writers on the show. I'll judge the quality of their writing when Volume 7 comes out, but what does this mean for everything outside the writing? Well, it frees up Carrie to take a more hands-on approach as director. It might seem like I came down on him, and I did because he deserves it, but it's not easy being a director when you don't have those expertise and you're also doing half the script writing on top of that. The other move is Grey Haddock stepping down as head of animation. He'll still likely be a producer on Ruby, but his role in the general oversight has been diminished. This opens up the possibility for a new studio head that'll do a better job at keeping everyone on track and well supplied. Either way, this is the biggest shakeup in Ruby's production crew since Monty's death, and I'm interested to see where the series goes from here. And that's going to wrap it up for this video. I hope I got my general points across. I'll get into more specifics next time when I talk about the rule of cool and how it applies to art design. But for now, I'm Mediocrity4. Thanks for watching.